It's fair to say that you are one of the most connected people in Washington, D.C. Kenneth J. Ken Keyes is managing director of the Federal Policy Group. The Federal Policy Group provides sophisticated, strategic, and technical tax advice on tax policy matters before the Congress. And I can speak from having been either on the inside or the outside. And it is only that portion of the source code. Working on tax legislation for 30 or 40 years. The outcome of the November election. Are talking about unrealized capital gains. A sick and angry world. We'll have everything to do with what a tax bill, whether it's in 2025 or 2026, may look like. She would raise the corporate rate from 21 to 28 percent. Kamala Harris is now proposing to increase the corporate tax rate to 28 percent. That would increase revenues, according to the Treasury Department by 1.4 trillion over 10 years. It's very possible that you would see a proposal to tax unrealized capital gains. Well, let me tell you why you really should worry about it. We've had President Trump come out in favor of eliminating tax on tips. Yeah. Let me just say, defining what is a tip, yeah, you right. may think is simple, but trust me when I tell you it isn't. A provision to exempt tips would cost over 10 years, 100 to 200 billion. Trump has also come out and said, I'm gonna eliminate the tax on social security payments. But there's a much bigger picture issue here, and that is. It's fair to say that you are one of the most connected people in Washington, D.C. You're the person that is was one of the people responsible for the 199A tax deduction and you're and both sides of the aisle come to you as it relates to um, questions around taxes. And I know that there's a lot at stake right now. And so what I would love to do is hand it over to you and, and, and just get the baseline of like what's happening. And then I do I do have questions around um, life insurance, annuities, how that might be affected um, when the Tax and Jobs Act potentially sudden sets, depending on who wins. Um, and then just like what what's happening? I know that there's a lot of the news um, around Kamala's talk about unrealized capital gains. I don't know if that was a slip up. I don't even know if that's constitutional. Um, so we can talk about lots of lots of different areas, but I just want to like hand it over to you. It is an honor to have you on and I want to be respectful of your time, but uh, I can't think of a better person to ask these questions to than you. And so thank you. Thank you for coming back on the show. Well, no, thanks very much for having me. Um, so the <clears throat> the current state of play is, uh, as everybody knows, unless they were under a rock for the last couple months, that there's been a fair amount of excitement, uh, upheaval, um, gnashing of teeth uh, over the whole presidential race. And there have, in, in Washington and really around the country, people, when there are presidential races, people talk about October surprises. And sometimes there is one and sometimes there isn't. Well, we've had so many surprises already. Yeah. Uh, the, the debate on June 27th between uh, Trump and Biden, of course, was a disaster for Biden. Um, the attempted assassination of the president, which hasn't happened since, I believe, 81, which was Reagan. Uh, the then decision of Biden to step down and then Kamala Harris to step up literally in 24 hours. Uh, these are pretty much unprecedented events. So the joke going around Washington now is the only thing that could be an October surprise is if we have space aliens land. OK, so it's pretty much we've gotten to that point. OK, I'm not saying there won't be an October surprise, but in order for it to surprise people, it's going to have to be really big. Um, so now uh, both uh, candidates have finished their conventions. Uh, just to be, you know, a nonpartisan about it, the Republicans had a good convention. The Democrats had a good convention. Um, both sides had things to say nasty about the other convention, um, but the truth is, both sides pulled off a pretty good convention. Um, and now we're down to the general election, which is less than three months away. Uh, and on the horizon in terms of events that matter uh, is the big one right now is a debate between Kamala Harris, the Democratic nominee, current vice president, and former President Trump that's set for September 10th. Uh, it's 
very possible will be one of the most watched debates in the history of politics uh, because there's a lot at stake. Um, there's also uh, a, a number of states where early voting starts in September, which I've always had trouble getting my head around. Um, mm -hmm. Like I always thought the election was the first Tuesday in November. Um, so people voting in September, it just doesn't add up to me, but that's, that's what the laws are. And it's up to each state, by the way, in case anybody's wondering to decide when and whether to have early voting. Um, so, you know, everybody's watching the election, um, a lot at stake and it, it, there is a lot at stake and the direction uh, for example, the tax legislation may take in 2025 or 2026. And I can explain why all the articles that you're reading that say there's absolutely going to be a huge tax bill in 2025 may be wrong. OK, um, but uh, the outcome of the November election will have everything to do with what a tax bill whether it's in 2025 or 2026 uh, may look like. And, and just to clarify why I say it could be 2026, the reason the pundits and a lot of uh, news people, uh, people that write for the press on taxes have said, it's gotta be 2025 uh, is because there are a bunch of provisions from the 2017 tax bill that expire at the end of 2025. So the reasoning goes, of course, Congress will address those expiring provisions uh, before they expire. Uh, how naive. Uh, Congress never does anything until anything hard, and this will be hard, no matter what the outcome of the alleges, alleges, uh, election, Congress never does anything hard until they're absolutely up against the wall. Um, and our, a year ago, we talked about Social Security, you know, we'll be up against the wall there in around 2034, 2035. But Congress won't be up against the wall at the end of 2025 for this reason. Yeah, the provisions expire and there are trillions of dollars of provisions expiring, including one that you just mentioned, 199 Cap A, a uh, huge deal. They're expiring at the end of 2025. But what, when does it impact a tax return, which is when the rubber hits the road. Well, it'll be the 2026 tax returns. And when do we have to file those? January, February, March of 2027. Yeah. So the notion that there's this hard deadline at the end of 2025 is not really consistent with the reality on the ground in terms of what the real deadline is. Now, just to be clear, people will be thrown into a real tizzy if they get to January 1, 2026 and Congress hasn't addressed this stuff because people will be going, I wonder what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. What should I do about estimated tax payments I have to make? Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's ideal, but all I'm trying to explain is the notion that there's this hard deadline at the end of 2025, may not be accurate. Um, and, and just, just kind of get a couple of the big items out on the table. Uh, the 199 cap a I already mentioned, Big deal. Um, uh, and that would be, if it expires, a big tax increase. And if we go back to- Is it, is it fair to say a 20%? Like, is it, 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 how, what do you think would impact the taxpayer that takes advantage of that right now? Well, under, under current law, if you qualify and, and most pass-through businesses, which includes subchapter S corporations, partnerships, limited liability companies, and sole proprietorships. Most of them qualify for a, a deduction from basically what is otherwise their taxable income of 20% of it. Um, so, you know, you do the math. If if your income all of a sudden goes up 20%, well, your tax liability is probably going up 20%. Um, and so, and, and that one provision when it was enacted in 2017, uh, I had a revenue cost of around uh, $600 billion. Um, so a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. Now, most of the expiring provisions will result in a tax increase. Um, so, for example, the, the top individual rate on taxable income, which the press 
relentlessly says is currently 37%. It's not. It's actually 40.8 because of the so-called Medicare tax, which is 3.8. And the reason I say so-called Medicare tax, even though it's called a Medicare tax, much of it doesn't go into the Medicare trust fund. Complete fraud. Okay. But put aside that little detail. Uh, it just ticks me off that nobody gets it right. But that rate would go up from 40.8. Um, it would go up to 43.8. Um, and, and so the top marginal rate would go up. Uh, the rate on uh, some capital gains income would go up. But uh, weirdly, one of the more controversial provisions of the 2000. 17 Act, and it's been controversial uh, for all of the last 10 years, is the SALT provision, which limits the deductibility of state and local taxes to $10,000. Um, that provision also expires at the end of 2025. So for the SALTIES, as I refer to them, who really hate that provision, uh, red, blue states, I shouldn't have said red. That's too confusing. As in blue states, which is California, yeah. Illinois, uh, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, uh, just to name a few. Uh, that's a big hit on them. The fact that they are only able to deduct $10,000 of their state and local taxes. Um, and that provision um, it also expires at the end of 2025. My only little warning to people is, that for those of you that really hate the SALT limitation, do not get your hopes up that it's just going to expire and go away and you'll be back to deducting all your state and local taxes. I find it hard to believe that will happen, no matter what the outcome of the election. Um, but, but the outcome of the election will control, at least in part, how much of it gets extended? Does it get extended with a higher cap instead of 10,000, maybe 50,000? Um, the current provision has embedded in it a marriage penalty. Um, so if somebody is married, a couple, they can only deduct 10,000. A single person can deduct 10,000 themselves. So there are people who argue, I must say, without being very persuasive, that people are deciding not to get married because the salt cap will be worse. If that's the only reason you're not getting married, I might have got news for you. You probably shouldn't get married anyway. Okay. Yes. I mean, that's probably that pretty low, you know. Yeah, yeah. You might know, want to rethink the whole decision <laughs> process there. But 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 it as a tax policy matter, going back decades, uh, Congress um, as a policy matter, it has tried to not have marriage penalties in the tax code because it, it, it just doesn't seem like good policy. So, mm -hmm. so one of the most obvious things that could be done, even if you were going to extend the SALT provision, is to eliminate the marriage penalty, which would basically mean a married couple get 20000 a single person get ten. Um, but there's m much bigger money involved in this thing uh, than as relates to just the marriage penalty you know, whether it's in or out. Um, so that's a that's a huge item. Now, some people may wonder, well, was everything from the 2017 Act, uh, did all does all of it expire at the end of 2025? And the answer is no. Um, the corporate rate reduction, which applies to what we call C-Corps, um, think Exxon, you know, GM, big companies, um, that was reduced uh, from 28 to 21%. Um, that was permanent law. Um, so that provision does not expire uh, at the end of uh, 2025, as do as does some of these other provisions. And, and just th this is really getting a little too wonky, but uh, some people just assume that when a tax bill is done by Congress under what's referred to as reconciliation, and, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, that you can't have any provision that goes longer than 10 years. That's actually not what the, the law is. The Budget Act provisions say you can't have any provision that goes beyond 10 years unless it's offset by revenue increases. Back in 2017, yeah, big corporations got a reduction of the corporate rate to 21%. 
but they also had a number of provisions that applied to them that increased revenues. And as a result, the cost of the reduced corporate rate to 21% beyond the 10-year window was offset by those provisions. And that's the reason the corporate rate uh, is permanent law, whereas, again, things like 199 Cap A are not. Um, now, I mentioned reconciliation. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, there are two possible outcomes to the November election. And, and weirdly, they may be very close calls as to which one happens. The first outcome, and, and I'm not putting these in order of which one I think is more likely, because I think it's pretty close. The first outcome is an all-Democrat sweep. So that means Kamala Harris elected president, uh, Democrats take control of the House, and they're able to retain control of the Senate, which they currently control, uh, 51-49, very close. Um, under that scenario, we are very likely to see a major tax bill that would be considered by Congress under reconciliation protection. And the magic of reconciliation protection is that unlike most legislation that goes through the Senate, uh, you, you can't do what's called a filibuster of it. And the reason filibuster is relevant is you need 60 votes to overcome a filibuster. If you're under reconciliation, you don't. All you need is 51 votes. Um, so my own prediction is if it's an all Democrat sweep, the Democrats under reconciliation will pass it through the House, their bill, pass it through the Senate, have a conference agreement, which means both sides get together and work out any differences and very likely send it to their new president before the August recess. So a year from now, that means we would have a new piece of tax legislation. Um, the other possible outcome of November is an all Republican sweep. So former President Trump wins. Uh, Republicans retain control of the House, which they do currently control by a narrow margin, five, six, eight seats, um, very, very close out of the 435 seats. Um, the speaker, every time he comes in, has to look around and go, is anybody sick today? You know, did, did, did we lose anybody over the weekend? You know, it's, it, it's pretty bad when you, that's the first question you got to ask every morning, Monday morning. But um, so uh, that Republicans win the White House, they, they keep the House and they get the Senate. Um, if that's the outcome and all Republicans sweep, we'll be looking at a reconciliation tax bill as well next year. But let me just say, the two different bills that I've just referred to will look very, very different. Um, and I can give you a little bit of an overview of that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Kamala Harris, as, uh, as you probably know, has gotten a little bit of a criticism for not having much in the way of policy positions. Um, and some of that criticism is pretty legitimate. And she's gotten criticism for flip-flopping. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Some have suggested she probably should have competed as a gymnast in Paris because she was so good at flip-flopping. Okay. But on taxes, she really has actually said some pretty clear things, or at least her, her people have, which is that she endorses the Biden tax proposals that were ma made in the most recent Biden budget, which was sent to the Hill in March of this year. And when a budget is sent up by a president, uh, whether it's Democrat or Republican, at basically the same time, the Treasury Department releases what's referred to as a the green book, so-called because it has a green cover, mm -hmm. which describes in detail all of the tax provisions that are in the president's budget. Kamala Harris, has basically said, I'm for all that stuff that was proposed in March. And that green book is quite detailed. Um, so uh, unlike some of the other areas where she's taking some criticism for not being very detailed or maybe not really saying anything at all, on taxes, she's actually said, yeah, this is what I'm for. And 
uh, that bill is pretty breathtaking in terms of uh, the proposals that are contained in it. Uh, major increases in, for example, the corporate rate. She would raise the corporate rate from 21 to 28 percent. That would increase revenues, according to the Treasury Department, by 1.4 trillion over 10 years. Um, kind of a big number. Mm -hmm. uh, it would increase the top rate on individuals uh, up into the 45 or 46 marginal rate uh, or higher, uh, which means when you would combine that with the taxes in a number of states, you know, states like California have like 13 percent tax rate, New York up there as well. You're talking about marginal tax rates in the almost 60 percent range. Um, so that proposal in the Biden budget uh, would raise revenues over 10 years by seven hundred and ninety seven billion dollars. Um, the Biden budget would treat uh, capital gains, which currently are taxed at 23.8 percent as ordinary income, which means whatever is the ordinary income rate, you know, if it's 44 percent, that would be the rate on capital gains. Um, so uh, the 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 Biden tax proposals, which, again, Kamala Harris has pretty much said I'm full on for, would result in tax increases in uh, the three, four, five trillion range. Now, she would also increase things like the child credit uh, dramatically. So she would spend a lot of that money on various things, uh, all directed at probably low and middle income taxpayers. Um, so, so that's what a Kamala Harris bill under an all Democrat lineup. That's the kind of things it would look look like. And if what are your thoughts on the unrealized capital gains? Like, is that you think that's pushed oh, too much? Oh, like, oh, it's very possible um, that you would see a proposal to tax um, unrealized capital gains. And what they would probably say is, we're only going to do that for rich people. Um, yeah. So we only do it for people. What say that have income over uh, or assets, assets over $100 million. So everybody out there whose assets are below $100 million, they all go, OK, I don't have to worry about that. Well, let me tell you why you really should worry about it. I have never seen a proposal like that get enacted with a high level where it impacts people and stay there. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you really think taxing unrealized gains is a good idea, it should be a good idea for everybody. Um, so, yes, if it was going to be enacted, it would be at a high level. But again, anybody who thinks it stays there is kidding themselves. Now, interesting question. You kind of alluded to it, which is is whether it would be constitutional. Um, there was a case decided by the Supreme Court at the very end of June. That, that's when the session of the Supreme Court ends and they, they go away for the summer and come back in October. But it was it was called the Moore case. Um and the Moore case dealt with an, a relatively narrow issue, which w was a provision from the 2017 Act, which taxed U.S. corporations on what's referred to as unrepatriated earnings that they had earned offshore in their foreign subsidiaries. But many people looked at what the court was going to decide on that case to try and get some insight into whether they were sending a signal, that is the court, about whether you could tax unrealized gains. Because people looked at the unrepatriated earnings and said, well, those haven't been realized. The, the U.S. corporation sitting here in America, those earnings were earned in France. Uh, that money hasn't been brought back. So it's an it's an unrealized gain too. Um, uh, for all all those people that thought they were going to get a clear signal from the court uh, as to whether you can tax unrealized gains uh, from that case, well, they were disappointed. Um, the court took a very narrow approach. Uh, pretty much went out of its way to say we're not telling you one way or the other what we think about taxing unrealized gains, um, and so we're let. 
telling you whether you should do it or shouldn't do it. That's our, that's not our job. Um, so yeah, I can assure you if Congress were to enact a tax on unrealized gains, there would be a constitutional challenge, which means it would take probably two to four years to get all the way to the Supreme Court in order to actually get a case into court and then on its way to the Supreme Court, you have to have what's referred to as a case or controversy, which may well mean in the tax world that you have to have a taxpayer who's actually been negatively impacted. So, so if you think about it, if the Democrats were to next year pass a tax on unrealized gains and it would take effect even – Let's say it took effect January 1, 2025, so retroactive to the beginning of, of next year. The, the soonest that there would be a case of controversy is when somebody filed their 2025 tax return, which would be in the January, February, March 2026 timeframe. And then they would contest whether or not uh, that was unconstitutional. Um, and they'd have to go to tax court, federal district court, then the court of appeals, then the Supreme Court. Now, there would probably be efforts made to get expedited consideration uh, by the Supreme Court. And there'd be a decent argument as to why maybe the Supreme Court should do that, because you have potentially huge amounts of money and a lot of taxpayers impacted. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly it would be challenged. Um, but would Congress, under an all democratic control, enact such a tax? Very possibly. Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't rule it out at all. How would uh, how would the life insurance and annuities and tax deferred accounts like any of those under under attack or any of those you think changing a lot with right now if all Democrats get, you know, president, House and Senate? Well, with, with an all Democrat lineup, um, you, you can see in the Biden tax proposals. And you can also see when you hear some of the general things that uh, Kamala Harris as a candidate has said, that there's a pretty significant focus on hitting high income taxpayers. Um, and there is currently, and there have been articles written about this, a proposal being put together by Senator Wyden from Oregon, who's the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, he's a Democrat, um, which would attack um, a product called PPLI, Private Placement Life Insurance. Um, and it's expected, although you never know about these things until they happen, that he's going to release the details of his proposal sometime in September. The Biden budget already had a provision attacking PPLI. Um, and, and my own guess is that what Senator Wyden releases probably won't look a whole lot different. Well, maybe we'll be surprised, but a whole lot different uh, from what the uh, Biden administration proposed in March. Um, but there's a much bigger picture issue here, and that is uh, if we're really focusing, not we, but if, if a major tax bill coming from an all Democrat lineup uh, next year is targeting high income taxpayers. Are they going to, are the, will they ta target any tax benefit uh, that goes to a person above a certain income level? Um, and some would argue that uh, life insurance has a tax benefit. They, they'd actually be wrong about that, by the way, uh, because there's a thing called the tax expenditure budget, which the Joint Committee on Taxation puts out every year, which lists all the tax benefits in the Internal Revenue Code. For 10, 20, 30 years, inside buildup of life insurance policies was on that list. But about now, 10 years ago, the Joint Committee took it off. And they said the, realize, the reason we're taking it off is – under normative principles of taxation, nobody, a person doesn't have income. If the inside buildup is still inside the policy, uh, they don't have access to it. And if they take it out, it has consequences, in, including 
uh, what the face value, what the um, amount of life insurance benefit there is inside the policy. So the Joint Committee actually t now 10 years ago said that actually isn't a tax expenditure. Now, having said that, um, if we're going to be talking about taxing unrealized gains, yeah. then taxing inside buildup would clearly not be much of a reach. Um, so uh, should people be a little worried about this under uh, an all Democrat lineup? I, I would say yes, worried. I, would, I wouldn't yet say panicked. Um, it's a mistake to think that there aren't Democrats who also believe life insurance is actually a really good thing. Yeah. Um, there, there are. Um, in fact, Richie Neal, who's the senior Democrat on Ways and Means, uh, comes from Massachusetts, uh, where there's uh, a lot of big life insurance uh, yeah. companies. But he also, I believe, he believes in the, the merits of life insurance. So right. it, nobody should just assume just because they have a D after their name that, that they would want to go after life insurance. But you come back to Wyden, uh, it it's pretty clear he's he's going to go after at least some version of it. And the okay. problem with going after um, something like PPLI is the slippery slope. Exactly. That, you know, because just to be clear, Congress rewrote, rewrote all the life insurance tax provisions back in 1982 and 84. And uh, I was actually on the Ways and Means staff when that happened. They were rewriting rules that were written in 19. 59 called the 59 act and by the time we got to early 1980 the 59 act was like completely out of date so uh, on a bipartisan basis uh, ways and means uh henson moore uh, a conservative republican from louisiana and pete stark as liberal democrat as there comes from california got together and spent three years trying to figure out the right way to tax life insurance companies and life insurance products. And it was out of that bipartisan effort, the, the code section that defines what is life insurance arose. And that code section, without getting into the gritty detail, controls how much cash value you can have in a policy relative to the amount of the death benefit. So it can't be overly investment oriented. PPLI satisfies those rules. Yep. Um, it, so it, it fits the definition of life insurance, which, again, on a bipartisan basis, Congress took three years to write. Um, so so it, it's a mistake uh, to just read, you know, some of the more hysterical articles um, that suggest it, it's something out of the ordinary because it fits the definition of what is life insurance uh, policy. But just to confirm that. There are people out there that we should be worried about. There's a draft law review article that just surfaced a couple days ago um, by two law professors, uh, and it's going to appear in the Virginia Tax Review, which is a pretty respected publication. The title is Reforming the Taxation of Life Insurance. Okay, immediately red alarm bells could, should go off because anytime you see an article that says reforming, it generally means there's a huge tax increase coming your way. And I, I've gotten a copy of this article. I, I didn't like like hack into somebody and get it. It, it was released in an article that appeared on Monday, a, a couple days ago. Um, and it's clearly an attack on PPLI. But, but the thing, coming back to something I said earlier, the slippery slope, there was an article that appeared in a publication called Tax Notes, which is a widely read by the tax nerd community, um, about I don't know, five, six months ago about PPLI. And it kind of went like this. Yeah, we should go after PPLI. Uh, defining PPLI is kind of complicated. Um, maybe the best solution is just to have a cap on all, the amount of life insurance anybody can have. Because that way we don't have to define PPLI. Uh, we just say anybody that has more than 500000 of life insurance, we're going to tax you. Um, that's the kind of thinking that should make <laughs> everyone nervous. Um, because in a way, the guy had a point. Uh, defining, it, it, it's, it's sort of like pornography. The Supreme Court said, you, you, you know what it is when you see it. Um, and so some people would say, well, 
I know what PPLI is when I see it, but when you have to start writing a tax statute that defines it, then all of a sudden you realize, geez, it wasn't as clear as I thought it was. Yeah. Um, so that's why when you read this article that they're going to publish in the Virginia Tax Review and you go, well, it's only about PPLI, I don't have anything to worry about, you really shouldn't stop there um, because – uh, if, if Congress really starts down this road, because what they'll worry about is as soon as they draw the lines of what is within PPLI, people will yep. figure out how to get it right outside those lines. Um, yeah. So it, anybody who thinks that it's only going to be a PPLI debate is really kidding themselves. Yep. Yeah. It's same, same thing with unrealized capital gains. I mean, even when income tax was first introduced, it was. It wasn't meant for all the population. Was, you know, and now look at look at look at it now. It's m majority of people are impacted by um, by it. So, w couple questions. Ten thirty one exchanges. That's another topic. What I almost hear from you saying is right now the Biden administration has some gray areas, but at the end of the day, if all Democrats get in, they will. They could right legislation that could potentially attack things like uh, annuities and and life insurance do you see like 401ks and iras and roth iras like do you see like any potential changes there and then my next question is is it you know back in the 1980s people were grandfathered in even with the, the modified endowment contracts like um would you uh, imagine that they would just say going forward this is the case and everyone else would be grandfathered in? Or how would you imagine this, like, let's say worst case scenario, this happens, how would you imagine, like, if people are watching this, listening to this now, like, I guess we don't know what we don't know, but history right. should tell us something. So, so history should tell us something. And generally speaking, and I can speak from having been either on the inside or the outside working on tax legislation for 30 or 40 years, generally speaking, Congress, whether it's controlled by Democrats or Republicans, doesn't like retroactive tax legislation. Um, however, uh, when it comes to some of these provisions that uh, significantly benefit high income taxpayers, and I'll use PPLI as an example, Wyden put out um, some discussion about what he might be willing to do on PPLI, and it suggested that it the rules should apply to existing PPLI policies. So anyone that just assumes no problem, uh, anything that we've got already is going to be protected, that just may not be something you can actually take to the bank, okay? Yeah. Um, with respect to unrealized gains, um, interestingly, when the income tax was originally enacted, after the amendment to the Constitution back in, I believe, 2016 or 1916, um, it only taxed capital gains that were attributable to assets where the increase in the value of the asset occurred after enactment of the income tax mm -hmm. because of the concern that if you applied it to the increase in the value of the asset before Congress had passed and the and the Sixth Amendment had been ratified that permitted the income tax, that that would be unconstitutional. Okay, but that's not the situation we're in right now. Uh, well, the income tax has been around for 70, mm -hmm. 80, 90 years now. Um, so is it possible that it would apply if there was going to be a tax on unrealized gains that that it would apply after enactment, including with respect to gains that have been realized in earlier years? Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and 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 the the difference in that choice <laughs> potentially is hundreds yeah. of billions, if not yeah. more. Yeah, um, so so no, no one can just say, you know, no problem there yeah. um, because there'll be a huge pot of money that will be very attractive to some. Do, uh, tax deferral, so 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs and all, like, the, are they an expenditure to the government? Like, and, and is there a world where they can play funny math there about 
your Roth IRA and whatnot? Like, what is your prediction? There? Is there any of those accounts on the potential chopping block when it comes to an all Democrat um, Senate, okay. House, and President? Okay, so um, there's already been some uh, areas where there's, there's been concern, rumblings. Uh, there, there are people that think some people have been able to put too much money in their R- IRA. Um, that there are some people that think uh, people, some people have too much money in their 401k. Um, and so it, it wouldn't be shocking. The sort of variations here, it, it wouldn't be shocking that, uh, there would be a provision that said, if, if your 401k is worth more than X, um, and I think Fidelity just came out and said, there's something like, I don't know, like 435,000. Uh, 401ks that they uh, administer that have assets of over a million dollars. I think those are the numbers. I could be a little off. Um, But because the kind of legislation we're talking about is going to all about being go after high income people, the the possibility of capping how much money you can put into a 401k is not crazy. I mean, it it, it may be crazy, but it's not crazy that it might be considered. OK, <laughs> and same thing with an IRA. Um, so uh, those are yeah, those are the kind of proposals. And, and then you'd get into the question of, OK, would that just say you can't put more money in? Uh, mm-hmm. Would it try um, sometimes as in some of these proposals coming from, you know, the Elizabeth Warrens of the world, the Bernie Sanders of the world? Um, th- there have been ideas like, well, if a wealthy person has too much money in a tax preferred account, um, then we will require them, even though they haven't reached retirement age, to take the money out and pay tax on it. Um, so, so there's any possible number of variations. If, if the theme is don't let high income people uh, enjoy tax benefits that are in the internal revenue code to, yeah. to a greater degree than we think is appropriate, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, then there's a lot of ways you could go about it. You could just say, can't put more in, or yeah. you could say, got to take it out. Um, yeah. I know, I know Peter Thiel made kind of like a splash when he like had his Roth IRA and bought equities in business and now grew it to millions and millions of dollars and how, you know, some people look at that and say, you're abusing the, what, or we're trying to help, you know, so I, I, you know, I, I get that. And, and, you know, I'm trying to be as bipartisan as possible, just yeah. get the facts. Um, right. So is there anything else you want to say as it relates to that? Cause I would, I want to go to all Republican, which I think will just be a renewal of what we've been living through. So it might be a lot easier to explain. And then I want to talk about what happens if Democrat president, Democrat Senate, Republican House, what that would look like. Okay, so so let's go to the all Republican lineup. Um, Three or four months ago, I would have thought what you you just said about what's likely to be in play was correct, which is of the 2017 Act provisions that are expiring, which ones do we either extend or make permanent? Um, Again, things like 199 cap A, the top marginal rate, et cetera. In the in the on the presidential in the presidential uh, debate that's gone on over the last month or so, we've had President Trump come out in favor of eliminating tax on tips. Yeah. Um, let me just say, defining <laughs> what is a tip, yeah, you right. may think is simple. But trust me when I tell you it isn't. I saw, I saw a meme. Uh, if Trump gets elected, people are, are going to go to their bosses and say, hey, can you pay me $10,000 and then the rest in tips? That's, all that stuff is out there. I mean, there's lots of uh, wheels turning already. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so so the, the general assumption is, without knowing the specifics, because no one can know the specifics yet, is that a provision to exempt, exempt tips – cost over 10 years, 100 to 200 billion. So all of a sudden we have in play maybe a $200 billion cost item. Um, uh, Trump has also come out and said, uh, I'm going to eliminate the tax on social security payments. Well, all of a sudden we've got another 
hundred billion or so in play. So whereas four or five months ago, I would have said that your speculation about what an all Republican lineup would lead to was probably pretty right, which is just what do we do with the expiring provision uh, from the 2017 act? We now have other ideas that are mm -hmm. not just ideas. They've been endorsed by a presidential candidate. Um, so all of a sudden it gets a little more complicated, but I would say generally speaking, um, your statement is still correct that uh, the tax bill under an all Republican lineup that would be uh, debated and passed into law probably by uh, next August would largely focus on what do we do with the expiring tax provisions. Now, um, l let's just stop for a moment because I think this is kind of where you were going anyway. Uh how likely is an all Republican or an all Democrat lineup uh, occurring? Um, the all Republican lineup, uh, you could see a little bit easier happening. Trump wins. And, and my own view is whoever wins the White House, that White party House. probably gets control of the House because because yeah. the House, the control by Republicans is so small. So if Kamala Harris wins the White House, my guess is she will have won the voter turnout war. And if you win the voter turnout, then you bring into office a bunch of people, what is referred to as down ticket, um, how, and in particular House members. So you could easily imagine Kamala Harris gets elected, Democrats get the House. The Senate is a, a little bit clearer in terms of where the Senate is going. Under current uh, lineup, there are 51 Democrat senators, if you include Bernie Sanders, who it, I'm not being critical. He's admitted socialist, but he he caucuses uh, with the Democrats. So 51 Democrat votes, 49 Republican. OK, when you look at what the current uh, senators under uh, up for reelection are, West Virginia Senator Manchin, who's a Democrat, is not running for re-election, and it's almost 99.9% .9 of everybody in Washington and the rest of the country believes Republicans will take that seat. Okay, so that means you've gone from 51-49 to 50-50. Um, there are six other seats which are Democrat-held right now, but there's only one where the Republican has a decisive lead, and that's in Montana, which is Tim Sheehy running against the incumbent, John Tester. Now, Trump's going to win Montana by 20, 25 points, which means Tester, who has proven resilient in the past, has got a very steep road to climb to win re-election. Um, the other Democrat-held seats where Republicans are hopeful they can make gains aren't they're not seats where in those elections Republicans are currently winning. Um, but if she he wins, that means the Republicans are at 51 49. Mm -hmm. That's a that changes the landscape dramatically in terms of a Kamala Harris president and Democrats controlling the House in terms of what tax bill they could do, because if Republicans control the Senate, that means that they have the ability to stop any bill from happening. So when you look at the Senate race by race uh, analysis, it, it is a little hard to see how Democrats actually get the whole sweep. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know what? You can have surprises. She yeah. has a stumble, whatever. Um, uh, but but if if you're talking about all Democrat lineup, we've talked about what it looks like. Um but I'm going to say that getting to an all Democratic lineup is not easy. It, on, on the Republican side, if, if Trump wins, again, it's likely um, that because of she, he, uh, mm -hmm. that Republicans are going to take control of the Senate. And if Trump wins, uh, that means Republicans won the voter turnout battle, which means they probably hold the House. So yeah. all Republican sweep looks a little bit more plausible than all Democrat sweep. If it is not a sweep of one side or the other, the whole picture becomes more complicated. Um, it means 
there has to be a negotiation between the two parties uh, to get to agreement on a tax bill. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the scenario under which, in particular, uh, I would suggest that if you think it's all going to get done in 2025, think again. Yeah. Um, Because this will be a very hard deal to cut. Yeah. Um, So the possibility that it would stretch into 2026 um, under what I what we refer to as um, split government. Very real. Okay. Wow. Um, Lot lot to unpack there. Um, Would you say just follow up question on the split government? Is there issues that Republicans like what hill are they willing to die on? And then what hill would Democrats be willing to die on? And what do you think a bipartisan bill would be knowing that if that's the case, there's most likely Kamala is the president. And so, you know, you know, what what would you, I mean, in two minutes or less, I, I guess it's hard and maybe we'll just have you back on <laughs> to yeah. talk about that if that's the case. It, it, it is hard. Um, you know, it, it, if, if it's, um, a Kamala Harris president, but Republicans control the Senate. Um, I mean, the Republicans may say attacks on unrealized gains never going to happen. Yeah. Um, they may say uh, eliminating the tax on Social Security benefits. Uh, we got to have that, uh, although yeah. I'm not really sure that that would be the case um, uh, for Democrats. Uh, the absolutes would be an increase in the child credit, um, yep. and, uh, and, and possibly because Kamala Harris has talked about this without being very specific, but I'll, actually some sp- specifics about housing subsidies, about yeah. uh, $25,000 uh, for a new home yeah, buyer, to, to, <laughs> for a new home buyer. She's actually talked about a specific number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, there would be things like that where people would say, we're not doing a bill unless we get this. Now, th- th- coming back to my prediction that it could stretch into 2026, we have a small tax bill that passed the House with a huge majority in late January of this year. It increased the child credit and it uh, enhanced uh, the treatment of some business provisions, r and um, bonus depreciation and the deductibility of interest expense. It got to the Senate and it has been stuck there ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, notwithstanding the fact that it is supported by the vast majority of Republicans in the House, the Senate Republicans said no. And my only point is if this little bill, and it's about 70 billion over 10 years, which in Washington is not a lot of money. Yeah. If that little bill couldn't get done, then think about how hard it's going to be to get a big bill done if you have yeah. split government. And that's why my prediction that it could go to 2026 is I think pretty uh, reasonable. Yeah. Is the, is the pitch the Republicans have almost like, Hey, we don't want to necessarily tax the value creators in the world and they could leave. And they also like, if people are spending more time trying to figure out how they avoid taxes instead of creating value, like we actually we're increasing the rates, but we're actually going to get more money in the long run. So and is is that like the overall pitch for the republic? Like, because because I also so I'm very con- conservative. Okay, I I want um I don't want to overpay on taxes, but I also look at the train wreck where our debts at and Social Security and all these things, and so it's like you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I I want to be able to like and no party this is bipartisan. Nobody wants to talk about those issues. So I guess I'm wondering, and, and I want to be respectful of your time and I don't have a hard stop, but if you would do like, I want to be respectful of that, but just like, as we finish up, how would you, how do you view like this looking out to the future? Because it's almost like we're, you know, changing seats on the Titanic, but we're not addressing the fact that we're sinking. Yeah. So, um, to some extent, I, I would say, uh, a perspective of Republicans is, um, uh, to protect provisions that help create jobs, economic growth, et cetera. But it would be a mistake to think that there are no Democrats that don't think about those things as well. Um, and um, there are uh, a number of Republicans and J.D. Vance, the, the uh, Republican vice presidential candidate, has, has come out in the last three or four weeks in favor of enhancing the child credit as a pro-family measure. Okay. 
Now, just to be clear, enhancing the child credit doesn't do much in the way of economic growth, you know, because basically that's money that gets consumed, which has some impact on economic growth, but it's relatively small. For provisions that significantly increase economic growth are provisions that favor capital formation, investment in plant and equipment, which means accelerated depreciation, things like that. Um, so uh, the majority uh, of re Republicans say in the Senate, if they controlled the Senate, would be insisting on pro-growth provisions, uh, which is one of the reasons they would be rather opposed to raising the corporate rate uh, from the 21 percent up to the 28 percent that Kamala Harris has endorsed and which was in the Biden budget. Mm -hmm. But you, you don't have to be a genius to figure out one party's at 20, 21 the others at 28, do the math, uh, 25. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and would, would the um, economists, uh, particularly the, the conservative economists, say that'll, that'll negatively impact growth? They'll say, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the Democrat economists will say, oh, you know, they can handle it. Um, so so the, the focus of Republicans would be economic growth, capital investment, but some would also, as reflected by J.D. Vance, would be let's do some pro-family provisions. Um, yeah. And, you know, so Democrats might be put a much more emphasis on how, how do we create more affordable housing? How do we increase the child credit? Um, you know, there, there would be some overlap. The problem is, and you touched on it, is this stuff all costs money. Yeah. And the deficit issue, I, I've been talking about it for 20 years, but I think I'm really approaching the point where uh, people really realize this is a disaster. And it's not just a disaster for the present, but we have two looming problems coming our way within the next decade, which is Social Security and Medicare. Um, so we are facing what is a fiscal disaster that is on now within sight. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden, uh, in earlier Congresses where people might have been willing to cut taxes and say we don't have to, quote, pay for it or offset it, yeah, we may be approaching a, a point where that's just not the case anymore. So that just is one more complexity um, to how this all plays out in 2025. Do it depending on how the election turns out, are will your services, will you be called on in all scenarios or is there certain people that may be more put poised to bring you in versus the other? Like what, what does your life look like over like this year and the following as, as these things play out? So, so uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. We tend to do well in periods of chaos and crisis. Okay, so, <laughs> you're gonna do well. You're gonna do well so, these next couple so years. So just, just <laughs> draw whatever conclusions you can from that. Um, and it helps that I like now I'm as old as dirt. So I, I've been around, and I've been. There's almost no new ideas out there. There's just ideas that people actually today don't know were thought of 30 years ago. Um, but I've been doing this for long enough that I'm pretty much aware of every idea that's ever come down the pike. Um, and I've had the benefit of, because I've worked in government twice, of knowing, um, you know, how the inside works. And yeah. that's kind of important sometimes. So so I'm not really worried about my livelihood. Um, and nobody, none, nobody who's listening to this should be worried about my livelihood. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll be fine. Well, we just, yeah. we just want people like you that have at least a voice because I feel like you're, uh, you give me a little bit of hope knowing that there's some people that are, are seeing big picture. And, um, again, you're, you're not relying on votes, I guess. And so you can maybe be a little bit more long, longer picture. Um, there's so many other questions I want to ask, but Ken, thank you. How can our audience support you? Or is there, I mean, is there anything that we can do or any ask that you would have for the people listening or watching this? No, not really. I mean, just bring me back because um, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot more to talk about after the election. Um, the, nothing stays static yeah. uh, in Washington. And 
in in the situation we're in right now, that's particularly true. I mean, the dynamic nature of what will be occurring here between now and say next August, when we could be having these two very different tax bills, it, the dynamic nature is unbelievable. And then I mentioned, who knows what the October surprise will be. I'm not yeah. expecting the space aliens, uh, but you can't count it out. Um, <laughs> and so, so yeah, I mean, there, there'll still be, there'll be a lot of new things to talk about, actually not in the too distant future. So amazing. Uh, that's, well, that's that's my final line. You have an open invite anytime. Ken, thank you for making very complicated things, uh, stealing them into different frameworks on how what the future could look like. Uh, thank you again for all the, the work that you're doing. And it was a pleasure to have you on. My pleasure. Thanks, Gil. <laughs> Take care.